Thank you all for coming. Merry Christmas. So good to see your smiling faces. Tonight, at this very building, at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock. It's December 24th, Lori, okay? Christmas Eve service here at 6 o'clock. Not 6.30, not 7, not 5.30, but what? Say it with me. 6 o'clock. Thank you. Hey, if you can bring a friend... Or an enemy. Bring an enemy. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Trick them, saying, yeah, there's going to be a rock concert. P pull the wool over their eyes. Bring them. It's going to be fun. It's going to be energetic. And it's going to be full of the Bible. We have a very special narrator tonight. And uh, it's, it's going to be great. Please come at 6 o'clock. Have I beat that into the ground yet? Not 6.30. That would be too late. So, if you would turn your Bibles this morning... To Luke chapter 2 with verse 1. Your Pew Bible, it should be 851, if that blue book in front of you, if you'd like to follow along. It's Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And I'd like to read this to you if you can follow along with me. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 says, At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral town to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem. In the Judea area. David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Hey, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart 
and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angels had told them. Wow, what a story, huh? Like I said in many days past, I'm sure in your lifetime you've heard these things talked about and addressed many times. If you heard Linus on the Peanuts uh, Christmas special back in the 60s when I was just a lad, um, he read a, a good portion of this story. It was probably the first time in my life I ever heard it. Maybe you heard it as a young person in church when you were young and and you were drugged to church <laughs> because you just didn't know what was going on. Well, I hope that by now a lot of you know what's going on. The world needs something. The world needs someone. The world can't do it on its own. This is what Christians profoundly believe. Jesus is our Savior, our one and only and we who call ourselves of Christ, the Christ followers, the Christians, for the last 2,000-ish years, we've been trying to live that out. We've been trying to express that. And as you know, history has taught us a lot of Christians got way ahead of the Bible. They got way ahead of the Lord. They said and they did stuff in the name of Christianity or the name of Christ, which sincerely gave us a black eye. Uh, you know, the Crusades and the Inquisitions and the terrible things, terrible, ungodly things done by people and organizations that had the cross of Christ on their breast or on their shield. What a shame. Well, I think God works through humble people like us. I think humble people like yourselves are exactly the kind of people that God can speak to. I think you're exactly the humble kind of people that can carry his message to a lost and dying world. You guys, or should I say yins. <laughs> That's the way we talk around here. Uh, he has entrusted his greatest message, God himself has trusted, entrusted his greatest message to us. That is so humbling. Because, I don't know about you guys, sometimes I drop the ball. <laughs> You know, sometimes I misspeak. Sometimes I want to represent Jesus, but I'm representing a fool. <laughs> and I drop the ball and I misspeak and I, I, my deeds sometimes don't, don't add up. But we have to constantly remind ourselves, guys, we know we're not perfect, right? But he is. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. We're not out to impress the world with our behavior and our wor words. Our job is to say, hey, it's him. You remember I taught you all those months ago. Here's the best way to witness. Here's the best way to share the gospel. Some of you know this. Just a reminder. This is how you do it. Can you do that? Do it on your own. Practice on your own at home. Go in front of the mirror and say, what did he say? Which one? Yeah, practice that. So, back to Bethlehem, a city a little bit south of what we know today as Jerusalem. Today, the area is, uh, of Bethlehem is occupied by Muslims. They have a lease on that place, and they will let you in. But if you are a Jewish bus driver, you've got to stop and let them off the bus, and you wait for them. There's a checkpoint there. Jews are not welcome there today as we, as we live and move and have our being. <laughs> but tourists, we are still allowed to go there because tourists got money and they like your money. Come on in, we'll show you the manger. Yeah, we'll show you this area that we've set aside. This is probably where it happened. This is probably the cave where he was born. This could very well be the manger in which he laid. I don't know about all that. You know, it's just, I'm no expert. I'm no geologist. All I know is this. I learned what I know by reading this scripture that has been handed down so faithfully over the centuries. And, and like I said earlier, we've heard it so many times that sometimes we get numb to it. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, that part about the angel. Oh, yeah, the manger. Yeah, yeah, got it, got it. What I would like to do is slow down a little bit and look at this with an open heart and an open mind. Would that be okay? Now, just uh, one more point of contention for me before I start in the story. Nothing irritates Tom Milnes more than this. When someone would speak up and say, Jesus is just a myth. That irritates me. Oh, really? <laughs> Jesus is a myth. Well, I don't think there's ever been a human being on planet Earth that has affected the world we live more than Jesus. He has a history. I don't care what you believe or how you believe it. There was a guy named Jesus who lived in this area that they call Palestine. We call it Israel. Uh, who lived there, who said great things that a lot of people didn't understand. He made bold claims. It is a matter of history and it is a matter of record. Recorded by the Jews, it is actually referred to in their Talmud, which is their history book. It's referred to by Pontius Pilate himself, who kept a record of his exploits. He said, yeah, one time I was... Uh, working in, in the Jerusalem area, and I hated it because it was so difficult. And one day they brought me this guy, and I didn't know what to do with him. And he made all these claims, and they wanted him executed. I'm just like, okay, go ahead. I washed my hands of the deal. There's actual historic documents that will back that story happened. No matter how you believe it or not, it happened. And there was contemporaries of that day, philosophers of that day, who said, oh yeah, we've heard about this guy. Yeah, we've heard about that. And, and so you cannot say Jesus is a myth. You can say, I don't agree with it, or I don't believe in the miracles he did, or I don't believe his claims. Well, you can do that if you want. But don't say that he didn't say this stuff back then. Don't say that they weren't claiming he did miracles. Don't say that he didn't claim to be the Son of God and that his followers gave their lives. They gave everything because they believed with all their heart that he was the Son of God. That is a matter of historic record, whether you believe it or not. And myths don't have historical records. So agree or disagree, that is your prerogative. But do not irritate Tom Milnes and tell him that Jesus is a myth. And if you really want me to throw something in your face, I'd be glad to. Anybody? Yeah, Tom, throw it in our face. Okay, you asked for it. Uh, what year is it? Mm -hmm. 2,023 years ago, Buddha was born. No, Confucius. No, no. Joseph Stalin. Mao Zedong. Uh, Charles Darwin. No, uh, I hate to break this to you, buddy. It was Jesus. Who else? Even the guy who calls himself the biggest atheist in the world has to sign his check, 2023. And God is up there in heaven going, <laughs> got him. There's no question this man lived. He said stuff. He did stuff. And this man claims he came the first time as a baby. But the next time, he's coming back as a full-grown man. Now, we're at a time of mercy and grace. We can say, I'm sorry, Lord. We can say, forgive me, Lord. But when he comes back, time's up. It's time to pay the piper. It's time to face the music. And our job, Christians, is to warn the people. People, get ready. He's coming. I don't know when. I can't pick the day or the hour. Nobody knows that, right? We don't know, but we're trying to be ready. We're trying to live like he could come tomorrow or in the next few minutes or maybe in 20 years. We don't know, but I want to live my days in anticipation and have my wedding dress ready <laughs> in my truth. So, no, don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. So, with that in mind, my Jesus is no myth. And if you want to take that up in the parking lot, I'll... Me and Barb, we'll take you on So with that. But you believe what you want. I happen to be a firm believer. There was a record that was kept in the Roman government. When this particular emperor reigned, this stuff happened. That was their date book. Who was in power at the time? And it just so happens, as a matter of record, and you can find this in your Roman history, it is there, Augustus said... I want more money. How can I get more money? All these places that we've taken over in the Roman Empire, 
Let's figure out how many there are, how many men, women, how many working class people they are. Give me a census. And when they're all gathered and they're all signed up, I will require of all those heads of the household money as taxation, right? Everybody loves taxes, right? It's biblical. <laughs> anyway, you don't have to like it. Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but don't forget to give to God what belongs to God. But that don't mean you got to like it. Anyway. This is a matter of record. This is when it happened. And in Syria, there was a guy named Quirinus. So there's two sources of historical record. They all had to go back to their hometown and register in the census so that their pockets could be picked. Taxation. Over taxation, you know. So that's where it came from. Did you ever think about that when you were hearing this story? Taxation. And, I'm sorry, Joseph was in the bloodline of King David. Now we know since the Babylonian takeover, there has never been a Jew who sat on a throne in Jerusalem. We know that Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70 as a matter of Hebrew record. So there has no, been no throne and no king in Israel since those days. right? But God promised a long time ago, that from the bloodline of David will arise a king who is going to be called the Messiah. Not just a great king like David, but the primo, deluxe, greatest king of kings and lord of lords. And we hear about him all through the Psalms and the prophets. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming, but we don't know when and we don't know how. We, we're looking for him everywhere. We're looking and we're looking. And they're looking for the Messiah. They're looking for the king. And all of a sudden, a baby is crying. They're the baby. Get out of the way, baby. We're looking for our Messiah. We're looking for a king. It's the baby. What do you mean? We didn't understand that. Read Isaiah chapter 7. Read Isaiah chapter 9. He told you. Oh, we got time for this. We, we're looking for our king. We're looking for someone like David. God snuck one in on him on that silent night. There was a baby crying, not in a hotel, not in a hospital, not even in a friend's living room. In a barn. Let's just call it what it is. A barn. All my life I've heard that expression, were you born in a barn? <laughs> Pretty close. I was in shooting. I couldn't have been far. <laughs> right? He literally, the most mighty, majestic promise of planet Earth, promised to Israel, the Messiah, the King Primo, the greatest who ever lived, God becoming flesh, is now dwelling in a little baby in a barn. Well, I hope they had a nice bed for him down there. Hope they had a nice little place to sleep. Have you ever seen a feeding trough? Have you ever seen the snotty-nosed, slobbering animals that eat out of feeding troughs? Any of you, my blessed farmers out there, right? Not the most sanitary thing. I mean, you could try. You know, maybe the animals are so hungry they ate the thing clean and they licked it clean. Still not the kind of place, not the sanitary place that you would want your little baby or your neighbor's little baby or someone you knew distant. How about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the second person of the Trinity, our Savior, born in a barn in a smelly, dirty feeding trough? How about that? Did you ever think about this stuff? How the, the greatest can humble themselves. What a humbling thing. And we want to say, God is not fair. God does not understand. God is so cruel. God is so this. And he's so disjointed. Oh, yeah? Tell that to the little baby. Tell that to the brand new parents whose minds were completely blown. We had the Savior like they promised, but he's got nowhere to sleep but this feeding trough. Could you imagine how crushed they were in their spirits? How, oh, we want to do better for him. We want to give him the best. They might have been really discouraged. And Mary just having a baby. I don't know about uh, ladies. This is, you're the experts. You're kind of worn out. <laughs> kind of uh, emotional. Kind of <sighs> not your best moment. <laughs> not your cover girl moment. You know what I'm saying? And here we are in a barn. And he's crying. And I got nothing but rags to wrap him with. And, and maybe they're, they're cut offs from the, the temple. Maybe it's the, the very same um, you know, rags that they wrap the sacrifices that they would take to the temple. There's a lot of great stories about that. But I'm just moving you through this. And while their baby was born, 
there were angels who were so excited. The angels knew exactly what was going on. The people of Israel really didn't know. I mean, there were a few wise men who we talked about last week who were still in Keith Haney's yard on their way. They weren't quite there yet. You know, refer to last week's message if you don't know what I'm talking about. So they were aware. The angels certainly were aware. Mary and Joseph were told the promise flat out. But nobody else was really on board with what exactly was happening. They knew a Messiah was coming. They just didn't know when, where, or how. They were looking around and while the baby was there, like I said. And, and, and now we have Mary and Joseph in that cave by a feeding trough, listening to their newborn baby cry, wishing they could have done better, probably. And way across the way, in a field, there were a group of men working night turn. Please raise your hand if, like me, you've ever had to work night turn. Some people like working night turn because there's no bosses around. They can do what they want. They can take a nap when they want. I particularly never, ever liked working night turn. I mean, I did such a good job. I'm not, you know, bragging or nothing. But my boss asked me to stay on night turn. Why? Because you're the only one who works. <laughs> So that was a character flaw of mine. I worked on night turn. Anyway. Take that, be that as may. Anyway, working night turn generally is no fun. They got to keep an eye on defenseless critters, sheep. Sheep have no claws. They don't have fangs. They're just a walking lunch on four wet legs. They can't even swim. They'll drown because of their, their wool being so porous. They, they go into water and they can go down like a rock. They're so helpless, you've got to watch them all the time. And there's wolves and other kinds of predators out there who want that free lunch. And these guys got to stay up. They can't go to sleep. Hey, what happened to all the sheep? I don't know. I fell asleep. You're fired. Get out of here. They got to stay up. It's a drag being a shepherd. Common, humble, working folks like you guys. You are the kind of people that God loves. You guys are the kind of people that God uses. You're the humble people that go out there in your world, in your, your jobs, your schools, or wherever you go, your neighborhoods, and you say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I, I, I was battling a lot of things, but the Lord is helping me. I'm getting better. I'm improving because the more of him I let in my life, the better I am. That is being the salt and light. That is exactly what God has asked us to do. Go tell them, tell them, tell them that I came as this little baby, that I lived under the law, that I served it, I fulfilled it, they executed me. I laid in the tomb for three days and I resurrected. Over 500 people saw me alive and 12 at least gave their very lives to tell the news, Jesus is alive. That is our humble message. But that message had to start somewhere, and it starts on this silent night. And who did the angels, who couldn't hold it in anymore, something's going on, there he is, there he is, there he is, he's there. Who do we tell, who do we tell? Oh, the kings, they're too proud. Oh, the doctors, they're too busy, you know, signing books. And, and, and they're doing, oh, she's on Oprah, she doesn't want to talk. Oh, I know, the shepherds, let's go to them. They'll listen, they'll listen. So, hey guys, here I am, I'm an angel, I want to tell you something. And what's the first thing the shepherd does? soils himself. <laughs> ah! I mean, how would you like to be surprised? Ever sneak up on somebody who's working night turn and go, hey! <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> anyway, I used to make a, a, a habit of it. The angel shows up. Hey guys, I got something I want to tell you. And after they soiled themselves and, and no, <laughs> calm down, peace be unto you. Fear not. Like we've talked about before, whenever an angel appears, the first thing he has to say usually is, hey, calm down, don't be afraid. I got really good news. And we've learned recently, the good news of God is the power of God. The good news, we call it the gospel. It's another word for good news. It changes things. It gives us a new perspective. It gives us a new outlook. You mean this world isn't impossible? You mean this world isn't doomed? You mean there's hope? That's what good news does. It tells you hope. It tells you a way. It tells you the truth. It sets you free from your current condition. This is the light that we bear as Christians in this world. And Jesus started as a little baby. And the angels couldn't take it. We are going to tell you something. You guys want no secret? 
promise not to tell anybody? They broke that promise. But anyway, tonight, a child is born. And all, they're all gathered around. Okay, well, what's next? He is Christ the Lord. He is the Son of God. He is going to... Ah, and the angels get all excited. And they start singing and dancing and whoo -hoo, praising God. And you don't believe us? Oh, you don't believe us, Mr. Shepherd? Huh, huh? Well, let me tell you something. You leave this field right now. Don't worry, we'll watch the sheep. You go down to town there. You go where the farm country is. You go to the first barn you see. And you're going to see a little baby lying in a feeding trough. That will be your sign. Here's your son. <laughs> okay? So, the angels do their rejoicing. They have a hallelujah party up there. Could you imagine how awesome that was? Angels know what's going on, but just about nobody else does. And they couldn't help it. They had to, woohoo, tell somebody the good news. So the shepherds are like, <sighs> maybe they had to have a cigarette after that. Like, oh man, what just happened to us? This is, whew, this is crazy. I know. Let's go down and let's see this sight. Let's go see. It's true. Let's get our confirmation, right? So they run down. <laughs> Look, is there a baby in there? No. What about over there? No, maybe over there. <gasps> there's one right here. Come on, guys. Come on, come on, guys. And there, like I said earlier, there's Mary. She's exhausted. There's Joseph. Oh, if only I could have done better. If only I'd have had a hotel booked. If only my cousin Joey would have had a room for us. I wouldn't be here in this mess. Oh, I'm such a failure as a father. Knock, knock, knock. Uh, Mary and Joseph, uh, can we come in for a second? Why? Well, we were just out in the field, and we had the most amazing story. We saw angels, and the angels told us that tonight a Savior was born, and that he would be a little baby in a feeding trough. And there he is. Your baby's the Savior. Isn't this awesome? And Mary got her confirmation that night. All this work, all this stuff I've been going through, traveling all that way when I was pregnant on top of a donkey, bounce, bounce, bounce. Oh, this is terrible. Try not to complain. Try not to complain. Joseph's like, we're almost there, Mary. We're almost there, Mary. We're going to get a nice room. So Joseph's there. Okay, you're telling me that God is okay with what we're doing here? That God knew we'd be here? That God is actually with us? And he shared it with you? Like I keep saying, that is a confirmation. God works heavily in confirmation. He'll tell you something, he'll lead you, and as you go, you have your opportunity to be discouraged. I've been there, have you? Am I on the right path? Was I really listening to God? That dream I had about Mary having a baby and it being a savior, was I just eating pizza that night and I just had an upset stomach and I had a wild dream? No, Joseph, here's your confirmation. The angels, they know They've been told by heavenly hosts, you're on the right track, God. You're not in the wrong place. It may look bleak. It may look horrible to you. It may look hopeless to you. But you're right exactly where you need to be. And here's your confirmation. Guys working night turns, smelling like the fields. <laughs> they needed Old Spice that night, but they didn't have it. <laughs> and Mary, it's true what the angel said to me. And we're, we're here, and here's our boy, and now we've got to raise him. Gulp. <laughs> Not the story there, but the, the, my, the thing I get from this every year is how awesome God is. And when he speaks to you, and when he's leading you, you may get discouraged. I'm just telling you, hang in there. Uh, someone told me a long time ago, when you get to the end of your rope, Tie a knot and hold on. Here we go, guys. Don't be discouraged. Don't be heartbroken. Don't feel alone. Gabriel told Mary a long time ago, well, at least nine months before this, what we're reading now, with man it's impossible, but with God nothing is impossible. Ask yourself this question. I'm going to do a little preaching here. Is that okay? Is Jesus your Savior? Is it just a nice idea? Just a popular thing? Are you a, a, a member of the, what, Creaster party? <laughs> Christmas and Easter? <laughs> Otherwise, you do whatever you want, whenever you want. I mean, is he really the Lord of your life? Is he speaking to you through his scripture, through his spirit, through our fellowship? Is he talking to you? Is he leading you? Sometimes that road can be mighty lonely. Sometimes you can be sitting at the lunch table all by yourself. 
Sometimes you just feel misunderstood and you get yourself doubts. Right? Like I said, I'm preaching here to, to people, humble people like yourselves. Uh, don't you dare give up. You are on the right team. You have a hope. You have a promise. You have a future. You have a destiny. And it's written by the finger of none other than Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the earth. Christian Kramer. Period. He's in! <laughs> if you had any doubts, you're in. <laughs> and I could write your, all your names in there. Written not by, oh, Tom, yeah, they're okay. Yeah, go ahead, Jesus, write them. No. What's Tom know? Right? You guys could be fooling me. You could be pulling the wool over my eyes. I think you're okay. But God knows. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Forget about that Santa stuff. Jesus knows. So the angel said, Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth to those whom God is well pleased. In this day and age, guys, I know you're hearing this too. Where's the peace on earth? Where's the goodwill to men? What are you talking about? This is a bunch of hooey. This is a bunch of high-minded, highfalutin, blah 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 religious stuff. I've heard people say that. Have you? Where's the peace on earth? Where, where's the goodwill? Where? Christmas is nothing but a bunch of commercialism. It's a bunch of this, and half of it's pagan. And You've heard all this stuff, right? Well... In my heart, ladies and gentlemen, I celebrate the birth of Jesus. And, you know, if, if everything just goes up in flames, he came. He did his job. He did it well. My hope is in him. I'm glad he came. I'm glad he humbled himself for me and for you. And, and Mary and Joseph bless them. What they went through, what they did for the next 30 years is outstanding. The pressure they were under, and they did a great job, young parents. <laughs> it's awesome. God loves that. God blesses that. Don't get discouraged or tired. He's with you. So where is the peace on earth and the goodwill toward, towards men? I don't know about you. I read this once. Jesus said this. Peace give I to you, not as the world gives, but a peace that passes all understanding. Right? You do this, and the God of peace will be with you. You do this, and peace goes out the window. He loves you. He blesses you. He calls you. You go do your own thing. You ignore him until things get bad. Then you call to God. You shake your fist in heaven and says, why did you leave me? Why? He left you. Right. Get back over to loving him, to fellowshipping with him, to saying, I'm sorry. What do you have to say today? Teach me your word. And guess what? Peace comes. I was working with a guy one time. Um, his name was Angry Al. <laughs> he was the meanest guy. Everybody hated him. He had no friends. Every other word out of his mouth was a word that I cannot repeat in present company. And he thought I was the most puzzling person in the world. He looked at me like his face was like this all the time. Like, he, he was not my friend. I, I couldn't really talk to him because he was so mean, right? He, we were a painting crew, and he was a fantastic painter. He knew what he was doing, but he was hard to deal with. Even the boss didn't want to talk to him. Well, he looked at me one day, and he goes, I can't say exactly what he says. How are you so blankety-blank and peaceful? Don't you know that blankety-blank and this and blankety-blank and that and this didn't come when the blanky was supposed to come and that blankety person? I mean, like I said, I can't repeat everything he said. Use your imagination. He, he, like, he looked at me. He just puzzled. Like, why can you sit there so peacefully? And I just said, well, my peace comes from knowing Jesus. And he was speechless. 
Yeah, Angry Al was speechless. Not because Tom's so smart or Tom's so holy. That particular day when things were going to heck in a handbasket, can I say that? That's about the raunchiest thing I could say from up here. Uh, when everybody else was upset and complaining and swearing, I don't know why, guys, but I just felt calm. And not because I'm so great or I'm so spiritual. I just like, I felt peace that day. I said my morning prayers. I might have read my morning scriptures that day. But I wasn't necessarily Holy Joe, <laughs> right? I was just being me with Jesus. And I frustrated angry Al. He looked at me and says, you're puzzling me. Why aren't you upset like the rest of us? And, and guys, you don't, have, you don't need to be a preacher or a PhD or a doctor of theology. Just be honest. I'm not perfect, man. I don't always get it right. But the peace that I have right now comes from Jesus. It's hard to explain. I didn't work it up. It's not in a bottle <laughs> or a pill. For me, it, it comes from him and he, because he's so awesome and wonderful. You know, that's, that day, I was a witness. I, I'll just tell you one more, and then I'll get back to the Bible. Uh, there, I was at work one time, and I worked on the eighth floor, and I had a bunch of boxes. I went down to the, the storage room. I got eight boxes carrying like this, right? And I get inside the elevator, and the eight button is up here, and I can't get my finger up there to push number eight. So I'm standing there like... How am I going to get, I'm not taking the stairs. What am I going to do? So a guy just at that moment comes in and he says, what floor are you on? And I said, oh, thank you. I mean, God bless, I, I said, this is what I said. I said, God bless you. Thank you. And he reached over and hits eight. And we're going up the elevator. And he says, are you a Christian? <laughs> now, think about this. All I, I never saw this guy before in my life. I'm frustrated. I'm not on my A game. I'm at work, right? I'm working like everybody else. I got a handful of boxes, and I'm waiting very impatiently to put them down and relieve myself of that burden, right? I couldn't reach the button. A guy comes in the elevator, presses the button for me. I say, God bless you, and he suspects that I'm a Christian? I wondered about that for a long time. And I said, yeah, how did you know? How did you know I was a Christian? And he said... Well, when you said, God bless you to me, I felt like electricity go through my, my body. Huh, that wasn't Tom. Where did that electricity come from? I was just being me through my day, and even though I didn't feel like it, God was with me, and a simple God bless you woke him up. And from then on, he and I met in the lunchroom, and we talked, and I gave him a Bible. And uh, he lived in the Greensburg area, and I lived in Elwood, so I couldn't invite him to church. But he got involved in a local church, and he started reading his Bible. And the last time I saw him, his life was kind of broken up. You know, different things were happening. He was telling me that things are improving. He was getting a peace that passed all understanding. Huh. Did Tom do that? Nope. All I did was say, God bless you. How's that for theology? <laughs> right? Well, this is the Lord. I'm saying all this. You don't know how you're coming across in your neighborhood, on your job, in your family, whatever you're doing. You have no idea how God is using you. So chin up, smile on the face, carry your boxes, and say God bless you. How about that for a sermon? Pretty good? Where's your peace on earth? Where's your goodwill toward men? Toward men? I just explained it to you in my life. It's yours too. I'm nothing special. A lot of you are much more pretty than I. Pretty funny, huh? <laughs> okay, all of you are much more pretty than I. Got you there. The shepherds went back to their fields with a new testimony, with a new look on life. And they couldn't keep their mouths shut. They told their story wherever they went. So... There was expectation. There was a buzz. There was a stir. God is here. What's he going to do? And in closing, I'd like to say this to the United States of America. 
God is here. What's he going to do? It looks crazy. I don't know what this could happen, that could happen. You know, people talk about being a prepper. You know, I like preppers. I hope I'm living next door to one if, if it hits the fan. Hey, you got a sandwich for me, Valerie? <laughs> you know, that'd be nice. Being a prepper is good if you want to be one. Keep your food and your beans and your guns here. Whatever you want to do. But number one prepper for me, I'm preparing my heart. I'm preparing my spirit in me. That no matter how bad things may or may not be, I'm no prophet. I want to be ready. I want to stand firm. I pray every morning, oh God, give me strength. Give me leadership. Give me directions. Open this Bible to me. Help me understand it. Don't let me go off half cocked and speaking out my rear end. Don't let me do that. Help me. Forgive me. Every day I pray that. And I recommend that for all of you. So, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Emmanuel. You guys know what that means, right? God with us. May God be with you, my brothers and sisters. I firmly admonish you, be here tonight at 6 o'clock. And let's worship the Lord. Let's celebrate the Lord together. Bring a friend and one enemy. Just balance it out. Okay? So I'm going to pray for you and release you. And I thank you for listening to me. God bless you all. Father, thank you for these words that you've written down. Every year when we read it, it's just such a special thing. Thank you for sending us Jesus. Thank you for that child that was born. Uh, fill our hearts with this good news. And may we shine it wherever we go today. Be with all the people here. Bless them with peace. Bless their families, their jobs, their neighborhoods. And God bless America. And a lot of blessings for Israel right now, we pray. So be with us and, and guide us and gather us together here tonight at 6 o'clock. And help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.